Daniel 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. What is a beast? What is a beast in your Bible key? A beast is a government or a kingdom. The first was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being and the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast. What I would recommend is that you number these beasts on a piece of paper so that you can remember who they are. The first was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched as it until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. Now, what have I told you regarding the kingdoms that are mentioned in the book of Daniel are going to remain the same exact kingdoms from the beginning until the end. So you kind of already know who these kings are, who, who these kingdoms are. And there before me was a second beast, with, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and powerful. It had large iron teeth. Okay, uh, iron, again, is being used to describe this kingdom. We know what that, king is, what that kingdom is, right? Rome has always... Iron has always been used to describe Rome. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. Now, I told you when we read Daniel 2 that the ten toes are coming out of papal Rome, but right now we have ten horns that are coming out of the fourth kingdom, which is pagan Rome. While I was thinking about the ten horns, there before me was another horn, a little horn, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Okay, that's always been used to uh, describe the Antichrist. So that should already be raising a flag in your mind. As I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was, like, was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all, all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming from out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. What's, what's that language that you hear in Revelation? This is a beast that's going to be, that is speaking boastful words uh, it is going to be slain. It's going to be thrown into the lake of burning fire, burning sulfur. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were, not, were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all of this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had the eyes and mouth, eyes and mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. 
He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another kingdom will arise, different from the earlier ones. They will, will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and laws. Okay, so that's what the Antichrist does, tries to change the set times and laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time, but the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. The kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers and wor will worship and obey him. This is the end of the, the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Okay, so when we read Revelation, we contrasted Daniel 7 with Revelation 17, because Revelation 17 is talking about eight kingdoms, and we discovered that the same first five kingdoms that are discussed in Daniel are the same in Daniel 2, are the same first five kingdoms discussed in Daniel 7, are the same first five kingdoms discussed in Revelation 17. Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome papal Rome, and then we needed to figure out what's the sixth kingdom. So this is just a matter of history. Atheistic communism through Napoleon is what took down the fifth kingdom of papal Rome. And atheistic communism fell to the United States. And in 1987, President Reagan, the United States, President Reagan, with the help of the Pope, brought down atheistic communism. Do you think that they might have had, the Pope might have had some skin in the game? Well, guess what? So did the United States. Because as we discovered in Revelation 17, the United States is actually the false prophet. They're the ones testifying to papal Rome. They're the ones testifying to counterfeit Christianity. What's rising right now? What do you see rising right now in the United States? Counterfeit Christianity everywhere you look. Every news station, every university, every church. And Satan's bringing together those systems right now, even though they hate each other. They're divided. They're definitely divided. You hear pastors saying it all the time. Why is there so much infighting in God's church? There is no infighting in God's church because God brings together his church by his spirit and his truth. There's infighting in Satan's church, in his kingdom, because it's a divided kingdom. But God has put it in their hearts to give over power, their royal authority, to the Antichrist. Now here, when we're talking about those 10 kings, that is coming out of Rome. But when we're talking about the 10 toes, they're coming out of papal, excuse me, yes, papal Rome. And we discussed in Daniel 2 that that is referring to the Protestant prostitutes that bore out of their harlot mother, the Catholic Church. But that here in Daniel 7, you have 10 kings that bore out of pagan Rome. And those were the 10 Germanic tribes that became Western Europe today. Who are the key players today, guys? Do you see that they're all in bed with each other? Europe, United States, Papal Rome, all in bed with each other. Do you see that through the United Nations? Do you see Europe coming together for the first time in history? I mean, they've always been divided. What's going on there in the European Union? All coming together in the United States testifying. So you have two things that are happening alongside each other because God shows you things in the natural in order for you to understand what's being put together in the spiritual. And you need to recognize this. You need to recognize what's happening alongside each other in order for you to know what's happening in the spiritual. It seems as though God's people have forgotten that God does this, that he does things in the natural. Like since the beginning of time, he does things in the natural in order to help you understand what's going on in the spiritual. He uses metaphors in order to speak to you. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you've seen correctly, for I'm watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling. I answered, it's tilting toward us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the people of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. And he goes on and he explains why it is that he's showing Jeremiah this in the natural. The Lord asked me, what do you see, Jeremiah? Figs, I answered. The good ones are very good, but the bad ones are so bad they cannot be eaten. 
Then the word of the Lord came to me. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Like these good figs, I regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes will watch over them for their good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. They will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their heart. I mean, goodness, that was a lot to get from the, from the baskets of figs. But like the bad figs, which are so bad they cannot be eaten, says the Lord, so will I deal with Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials, and the survivors from Jerusalem. Whether they remain in this land or live in Egypt, I will make them abhorrent and an offense to all the kingdoms of the earth, a reproach and a byword, a curse and an object of ridicule, wherever I banish them. I will send the sword, famine, plague, and plague against them until they are destroyed from the land I gave them to them and their ancestors. Have we established that God speaks in symbolism, that he causes physical things to happen so that he can speak to us, that he speaks to us in metaphor? It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth because it's coming from the heart. He called Israel a flourishing olive tree. He calls you a body, a kingdom, a church, a temple. Does he use metaphor, guys? Does he use these things to show you? He doesn't have to, but for those who are paying attention, perceive what he's saying. Perceive what he's doing. On the one hand, you have 10 kings that were the 10 Germanic tribes that became Western Europe. They're going to testify. They're going to hand over their royal authority to the beast, to the harlot riding the beast, the church that rides government, the harlot Catholic Church has world power. It is the fifth kingdom. It is the kingdom that will rise again as the eighth kingdom. The only one who fits all of the descriptions provided to us in Revelation 17. And so if you missed that study, go study Revelation 17. Allow me to remind you of a few things. It has to be a world power with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, Revelation 17.2. 17, it's not a small church. It's a church that's been involved with the whole world and major powers. The Catholic Church stands for universal, and no other church has had universal power as the papal power. It leads the whole world astray from God's word, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. They teach contrary to God's word. They lead others into spiritual adultery by adulterating the word of God, when people have tried to call the people back to the word of God, she's been arrogantly above questioning. I'm not a widow. I'll never mourn. I don't have to answer for myself. You see it happen. When you see that, you know, that organization, the, the people who were abused by priests, you see them come and, and they're calling to the Pope and they're saying, hey, what happened with this and what happened with that? And he turns around and he's, oh, no say. I don't know what you're talking about. They don't have to answer for anything. How many times have those organizations and different governments said, you need to apologize for what has happened? World power, world abuse, they're never held accountable for any of it. But they will. A persecuting power. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, Revelation seventeen six. The fourth clue is uniting of church and state. So he carried me away into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, Revelation 17, 3. So remember that a woman is a church and a beast is a nation or government. So this is not only a unif unification of church and state, but it is that woman, that church is controlling state, is controlling that beast. The fifth clue has to be understood through the process of elimination. So you have five had fallen, one is, one is yet to come. The beast that, it, that was is not and is also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. So you kind of have to understand where is John at the time of that vision? Not, as, not where is John at the time of his life, but in the vision, where is John? So here's your clue. Five have fallen, one is. Five have fallen, one is. Where is John? He's at the sixth beast. So that means we can eliminate the sixth and the seventh beast, it's got to be one of the five. Even though it says right here it's one of the seven, we can eliminate six and seven because of where John is at the time of the vision. It's got to be one of the five. So of the one of the five, there's a uniting of church and state. 
It had to receive a deadly wound that was healed. And all of the other clues that I provided to you it has to be a world power, leads the world astray from God's word, persecuting power. And we know, we know the great persecution of the Catholic Church through the Spanish Inquisition, for example. It is a uniting of church and state, a permanent place in the United Nations. No other church has that. And it had to receive a deadly wound that was healed. So it fell and it's going to rise again. Papal Rome is the only one who fits all of these descriptions. So we know that that is the Antichrist. Now let's go through these kingdoms in uh, Daniel 7. We already know who they are. They're the same kingdoms that we learned about in Daniel 2. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome. What's 6, 7, and 8 in Revelation 17? Atheistic communism, the United States, the false prophet, and papal Rome. 6, 7, 8. So some of the little pieces of description here, even though we know who they are, Babylon was seen as a lion, was overthrown by Medo-Persia that was described as a bear. So the bear was seen as having three ribs in its mouth, representing the countries that it overthrew. Medo-Persia was overthrown by Greece, and it was represented by, as a leopard or by a leopard with four wings, representing the swiftness with which Alexander the Great took everything. And it had four heads representing the four generals who took over the kingdom when he died. Greece fell to pagan Rome. Then papal Rome, which has always been described as iron, right? And so you see those iron teeth. Papal Rome ruled until 1798 AD. And you see papal Rome, this fifth kingdom, being described exactly as the Antichrist is described. With eyes and a mouth that speak boastfully, they speak against the God of gods, try to change his set times, persecuting the people of God, waging war against God's holy people. Is God clear or is he not? Is he not clear in the word? Does he not want us to understand what's going to happen? And is it not with 100% accuracy? We already know that this kingdom absolutely has done these things already, and it will do so again when it rises again. But the court will sit. And his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. We already know what's going to happen. So what is the metaphor that's happening alongside? Well, you have the 10 kings that are going to give over power to this uh, Antichrist. You have the false prophet of the United States that is also testifying to this Antichrist. And you have the 10 toes that bore out of the harlot Catholic Church, the prostitutes that bore out of her. They also will be handing over their power to this Antichrist. They will be reconciled in these days. That's the message Pope Francis preaches, right? Reconciliation. I don't know why in the world you'd want to be reconciled with your abuser, but okay. I mean, they're going for it, right? And they're going for it because God has put it in their hearts to do such a thing. It's all counterfeit Christianity. That's the other thing that you need to understand is that the spirit behind all of those systems, God's spirit in his people brings together his people in unity. Well, a similar thing happens with Satan, although his, his, you know, what he has established, he pits against each other. Like if you think of a typical abuser, that's what they do. They pit people against each other. They're always manipulating and puppeteering. And that's exactly, that is a strategy of Satan. It's not like man came up with that. It's what Satan's doing through that person. Those of you, you know, diagnosing every, everyone a narcissist, you need to have knowledge and understanding about what is actually going on. When you say narcissist, all I hear are symptoms of the devil's character. That's all I hear. And that's exactly what the world calls a narcissist. That's exactly what they do. It is the character of the devil. It is a person who does not do their own work and therefore, Satan lives through them, and that's the character that's coming out of them. So what Satan will do in these last days, and what he's already started to do, is to reconcile what he has established in the world. And there's a lot that he has established in the world. His army is so much more massive in quantity than the army of God. And yet God will stand, because he's already demonstrated in the word that he didn't need a big army. He didn't need, even need anyone in his army, to, to be perfectly honest, in order to triumph. He is perfectly capable of fulfilling everything that he has said he is going to do without a single one of us 
it's his good pleasure to use us. It is our covenant that he use us. But what Satan is going to do is he's going to bring everybody together. And how's he going to bring them together? Does he bring them together in love and unity and, you know, peace and clarity like God does? No, he brings them together in, in greed, in their disgusting filth, in their sin, in their desire for glory and pomp and power and status. That is what he brings them together in. And so you see what happens when you have a field like medicine, which is fundamentally anti-Christ, anti-creator, a field of science that claims that it can covet God's creations, it can make babies, it can save your life, it's hero. It's a hero. It can pour poisons down your throat and make you into a different gender. All of these things, right? There's no creator. We're your heroes. We're your gods. Submit to us. And you have a government that forces you to submit to them. You have insurance companies that dictate what you're going to be doing. Research sellouts pharmaceutical companies funding that research. So now you can produce whatever results your funding source is going to provide and totally sell out. And robots that do everything that comes out of research and regurgitate it and regurgitate it and say, where's the science? Where's the research? Trust trust the science. I believe in science. Does that mentality go together? Because I, I, you know, I've seen uh, yard signs in my town. I love is love. Be kind. Kindness is everything. And believe in science. And follow the science. And worship the science. And bow down to the science, okay? Enough already. Do you see all those satanic systems working together for their greed and power? You're not allowed to go certain places if you don't have a vaccine. You're threatened if you don't get your children or your pets vaccinated. Coercion. Conquering. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. All of the systems that he has established are going to come together. You know, a year, uh, maybe five years ago, we, if I was saying this to you, you would have been like, why is, what do you mean government is going to be involved in this? What do you mean uh, education is going to be involved in this? Do you not see them all coming together? Education is one of the biggest sources of antichrist propaganda. And you know who has her hand in all of it? The antichrist, the harlot Catholic church. They've got their hand in all of it. I saw something the other day about, uh, you know, Catholics for LGBTQ, whatever, whatever. And the Catholic Church may, puts out a statement saying, well, this isn't us, basically. It's not us. We don't affiliate ourselves with this. But they don't put out, they don't put out a statement saying, here's our position. They don't say that. They don't put out a statement saying, here's what the Word of God says. No, everything is about litigation, covering their legal butts so that they don't have to pay anything to anyone. All of those systems that the devil has established are going to be reconciled. The prostitutes will be reconciled with their harlot mother. They hate her. We know that. But they will be reconciled for the moment. And we know that in the end that they will burn her with fire. They're all going to turn against each other, okay? And they're all going to destruction. They're all part of the same kingdom. And they are going to weep and they are going to cry out in terror when they watch her fall. You saw that in Revelation. You saw what's going to happen. Now you know the key players. Now you know who's involved. There is a something that is happening in the physical, physical kings, physical kingdoms. And then you have the spiritual kingdom that is behind it. So God is in his brilliance demonstrating something for you in the physical in order to help you to understand what is happening in the spiritual. These are the people who will kill you. Those who claim to be doing a service to God. And they will probably really believe that that's what they're doing. Those are the people who will persecute and kill you. And they will go to their destruction. They will worship the beast. They will receive the mark of its name. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. They will bow down to you and acknowledge that God has loved you. They are those who claim to be Jews, though they are not but are of the synagogue of Satan. Remember in Revelation 3, God says that to the church in in Philadelphia. And in Revelation 2, he says, I know the slander of those who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. God has warned you of what's going to happen. He has let you know, and he has let you know with specificity and clarity before it even happens. And this is exactly what we're seeing rising right now. You need to know. You need to know ahead of time. And you need to go to him and be prepared by him. Thanks for listening. I look forward to Bible study.